All right. Looks like we're recording. So welcome to the Evergreen Streamlined PCP and PA webinar. For those of you who I haven't had the pleasure of meeting yet, my name is Leslie Miska, and I joined the Office of Aging and Disability Services back in February of 2016. I'm the Information Services Manager here at ODES, and my primary role is um, oversight and management of our electronic data systems. That includes currently EIS and futuristically for all of you folks, the Evergreen Data System. Joining me on the presentation today is Nancy Kitchen. She's one of our ODES data and compliance specialists, and she's been an integral uh, participant in the Evergreen project right from the beginning, helping us with requirements and some of the testing, and she'll be uh, involved in training as well. And also likely joining up here uh, in the next minute or two will be Walter Goodlett. He is our Evergreen Project Organizational Change Management and Communication Subject Matter Expert. So some of you may have met him already on one of the previous webinars or as part of the Change Champion Network. Next slide, please, Nikki. Over the next hour, I plan to share a little bit of project background, the streamlined person-centered plan and prior authorization process, some next steps and details for staying engaged and getting additional support. And then we'll wrap up with answering as many questions as we can in the time that remains on our in our hour together. Couple of housekeeping items before we dive in. All of you as participants have been added to the meeting in listener mode, therefore your line is muted. So we ask that you type questions into the Q&A using the Q&A icon in your Zoom menu. You can do that anytime throughout the presentation. And at the end, we should have about 15 to 20 minutes and I'll answer as many of those questions as I can get to. And any that I am unable to get to, we will add to our list of frequently asked questions and we'll be sure to post a response to those on our project website very soon. Next slide, please, Nikki. The purpose of the Evergreen Data System Project is to implement a single electronic data system that will replace the office's three major legacy systems. That includes EIS, MAPSIS, and MeCare. The project is being completed in a phased approach, and this is the first phase of multiple phases, which included three production releases. The first release was back in May of 2019. It was a very small pilot release. It has just a couple of internal state staff users and it was for managing our developmental disabilities wait list. Then in June of 2020, we had our first major production release where we released our adult protective services and our public guardianship conservatorship programs into the system, into the Evergreen system. And our third production release is scheduled for January 16th, 2024, and it will move the ODES Developmental Disabilities programs, as well as the neurobehavioral programs that are currently managed in EIS into the new Evergreen system. The primary goal is to enhance the quality of services for our constituents and the people that we serve. Some of the benefits that we will recognize by moving to this new system are automation of some of the current paper or manual processes, reduction of some of the redundant data entry that we have in EIS, streamlining some of our workflows and business processes, and improving our data and reporting. Next slide, please, Nikki. Please note that I will be providing a very high level overview of just some of the portions of the de developmental disabilities person-centered planning process and will not be able to show every screen or field within the forms that I'm gonna present today, nor will I be able to point out every field or feature on each of these slides that we're showing in the slide deck. However, there will be plenty of time for you to explore the system between now and January. I also wanna remind everybody that access to the Evergreen person records and forms as well as their data is role-based, so depending on your role, you may or may not have access to everything that you're seeing during this webinar. Like other forms, the person-centered plan can be found by navigating to a person record and then clicking on the forms and plans icon, which I've circled on the left-hand side of the screenshot. And you can tell that I was on the forms and plans when I took the screenshot because it is white in the background instead of the green navigation bar color. This is your primary navigation. 
If your role includes the ability to create person-centered plans, once you've clicked on that forms and plans icon, you'll be on the all forms list page and you'll be able to click and select the plus add new form button, which is in the upper left-hand corner. And then you'd be able to select person-centered plan, which is a form under the case care plans form and forms category. And then once you've done that, it will present you with the screen that you're seeing here where you would select the waiver program for which this PCP is being created. In this example, I chose main care section 29. And then you would choose the PCP type of initial. When you're creating from new, that's your only PCP type. The person-centered plan does allow for a revision similar to the way that you revise PCPs in EIS right now. And that's done from an existing PCP. So you would find that in your all forms or your custom PCP list page. And then you do use the little ellipses icon to do a revision. And you would revise to either a change type PCP or an annual PCP. In this case, I selected program of main care section 29 and PCP type of initial and the system alerted me and I've circled that at the bottom of the center of this screenshot and it's a, like a yellow highlighted message and it's telling me that the person record Leslie test that's my person record does not have a completed comprehensive assessment and that completing the comprehensive assessment first will save redundant data entry and asks me whether I'm sure I want to continue. If you don't want to capture data twice, you can simply click cancel from here and be navigated back to the all forms list page where you can use that plus add new form button to create a comprehensive assessment form first. The comprehensive assessment form is located under the assessments category. Next slide, please, Nikki. Upon creation of the comprehensive assessment, the system will navigate you into the form. The comprehensive, comprehensive Assessment is a new form which will become part of the Developmental Disabilities Person-Centered Planning process once we're in the Evergreen system. The Comprehensive Assessment will replace the existing BMS 99, Psychosocial, and portions of the V7, and the remaining portions of the V7 have been incorporated into the Person-Centered Plan itself. Just like other complex forms in Evergreen, you will be defaulted to view mode when you are when you create the comprehensive assessment. So you can see on the left hand side of this screenshot, I've circled the little edit mode icon and it has a little gray button. It looks gray, the little button in the middle. That means I'm in view mode. Um, you can use the toggle icon in the upper right hand corner of the screen, which I've circled to open your quick scroll menu. Um, which I've done. You can see that I've clicked that toggle because it has a little orange um, button in the middle and it's showing me my menu. This menu will show you all of the sections of the form. So the sections of the comprehensive assessment form are overview, assessment information, health and wellness, home and housing, safety and security, community engagement, employment, social and relationships, lifelong learning, communication and advocacy, summary and skills and abilities definitions. You can either scroll to view each section of the form or you can click on any one of those headers in your quick scroll navigation and be automatically directed by the system to that section of the form. To populate the form, you will need to click on that edit toggle in the upper left-hand content to get yourself into edit mode. Prior to beginning the comprehensive assessment, you can click on the print icon, which I've done when I took this screenshot. I had clicked on that little print icon, which opened up this additional menu that I've circled in the center of the screen here. This would allow you to run the exploration and discovery report from this menu, which we covered during the reportable events and progress note webinar. So if you have, haven't had a chance or you didn't participate in that webinar, certainly encourage you to go and listen to that one. It will tell you all about the exploration and discovery report. Once you have run that, you can use that data to help populate the comprehensive assessment. And then once you've completed the comprehensive assessment, you could come back to this print icon if needed and print the BMS 99 comprehensive assessment 
um, version of the form, which will uh, print just the BMS 99 questions if that's needed. Next slide, please, Nikki. Once in edit mode, you can use your quick scroll or page arrows to move to the sections, subsections that you want to populate. As highlighted in the quick scroll menu, each domain based section of the comprehensive assessment will follow the same structure. So if you um, participated in the first webinar series, you heard me talk about the person record and the person history and the fact that the person history um, was captured under the top eight top level charting the life course domains. The comprehensive assessment has also been structured using those eight domains. Health and wellness is the first of the eight, eight domains and also the PCP has um, these eight domains. Each of the eight domains in the comprehensive assessment have the same structure. The very first item, sub item or sub section under that domain will be that any, his, it will display any history items that have been captured at the person record level under that top level domain. Then depending on which domain you're um, in, in the comprehensive assessment, you would get either two or three additional subdomains, which are related to that top level domain and will display relevant con content from the person record for that topic, followed by a set of custom assessment questions. And then the last subsection under every top level domain is the standard need assessment for that domain. The need assessment, as shown in the central content area of this slide, is a standard, a standard set of questions, including whether there is a need identified for that domain. And if yes, then it would be a required description of that need, as well as a multi-ad list, which allows you to enter as many individual needs that the person may have related to this top level domain. Each need that is added will display in the table format that's shown at the bottom of the content area of this screenshot. In this example, I indicated that there was a need of free and reliable transportation to get to and from the gym Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. I then added the need of transportation with a description of Monday, Wednesday, Friday to and from the gym. Next slide, please, Nikki. Underneath the need question in the multi-ad list, there are two more multi-ad lists for capturing as many individual strengths and individual barriers that the person possesses in relation to this top level domain and this specific need. Prior to adding any records, the system will display a message similar to what you're seeing here on the screen. It will say no strength records available or no barrier records available if you're in the barrier section. And there'll also be this green button, plus add strength or plus add barrier, depending on which section you're in. Next slide, please, Nikki. In this example, I used the plus add strength button and I added a strength of motivated with a description of Leslie enjoys working out and is motivated to go to the gym regularly, which displays in the same table format as the need did. Please note that all of the data captured in the comprehensive assessment will be viewable from within the person-centered plan and any needs, strengths, and barriers that are captured under each of these domains will flow into the person-centered plan so that the case manager or care coordinator does not have to recapture that data. Next slide, please, Nikki. Once the comprehensive assessment has been completed, you can then uh, navigate back and create your person-centered plan. So in this example, I've again selected program of main care section 29 and a type of initial, and the system has defaulted the plan effective date range for me by setting the effective start date to today's date and then the end date to the same month and day plus one year. However, these dates are editable, so you can edit those dates if needed. Next slide, please, Nikki. Upon saving, the system will navigate you into the Person-Centered Plan tab or PCP tab of the PCP form. 
which is what we're on when I took this screenshot. Just like the comprehensive assessment, you will be in view mode and you can use the toggle icon in the upper right corner of the content area to open your quick scroll menu, revealing the top level sections of the person center plan, which are overview, personal profile, exploration and discovery, my meeting, my circle of support, my life planning, rights, supports, and modifications, summary of meeting, summary of plan. Please note that the Evergreen Person-Centered Plan matches the EIS Person-Centered Plan. The only significant differences are that the Evergreen PCP is more dynamic. For example, in Evergreen, the PCP has the ability to display content from the comprehensive assessment and the person record and is more automated than the EIS version. For example, the Evergreen Person-Centered Plan will auto-generate service implementation plan forms, as well as HCBS rights modification of addendum forms and prior authorizations. And it will also trigger notifications to the different system users, letting them know when these forms have been created and are ready to be populated and or reviewed. Both the PCP and the Comprehensive Assessment also have this Add Information button, which I've circled in the top center of this screenshot. This allows the case manager or care coordinator to add history items, person contacts, or attachments directly from within the PCP rather than having to navigate away from the form and do that at the person record level. Next slide, please, Nikki. The PCP has four workflow statuses, which include pending planning team meeting, which is the status that the plan will be in when it's first created through the team meeting until the team meeting has occurred. Then the next status will be pending state review and then pending provider selection and then plan completed. In edit mode, you are able to see the subsections of the plan in your quick scroll menu. In this example, I circled the exploration and discovery section, which is over on the right-hand side in your quick scroll menu. This section of the PCP has subsections of exploration and discovery person-centered thinking tools, getting the life I want, and other agenda items. In the central content area of this screenshot, you can see that I am in the getting the life I want section or subsection under the health and wellness domain. So the getting the life I want subsection is the domain-based section of the PCP. And if you click on the header, in this case, health and wellness, it will expand an accordion, which will display the health and wellness section of the most recently completed comprehensive assessment so that you can see all of the items that were displayed over there, as well as all the custom questions and their responses. And that way you don't need to navigate away from your PCP to see the information in the assessment. Just like the person history, progress note exploration and discovery and conference of assessment, this section is domain-based and each domain has the same set of questions. There's one text field and four multi-add lists. These questions will create the goals under the My Life Planning section of the PCP and the available selections under the risks dual lists that are in the My Life Planning section. These questions are what's important to for me, which is a text field, and then what I want to stay the same maintain, which is a multi-add list, meaning you can add as many items that the person wants to maintain or stay the same as are relevant to this domain. What I want to be different, add, change, or stop, which again, you can add as many of those items as needed through the multi-add list. And then two additional multi-add lists for these are the risks with what I want to stay the same, and these are the risks with what I want to be different. And again, you can add as many as necessary. In this example, I indicated that going to the gym was important to or for me. And what I wanted to stay the same was going to the gym Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. To continue populating the plan, you can use the page navigation buttons at the bottom of the screen, which I've circled here. 
um, please note that you should use the save button to commit content to the database before moving away from your computer. So anytime that you're working within the form, if you've added some data and you're going to step away, definitely make sure that you hit that save button first. If you're not moving away from your computer, then you can use the save and next button. This will save the data that you've added to this screen and move you on to the next screen. Only use the arrows to page through the plan if you have not added data on that page. If you use the arrow and you don't use one of the save buttons, it will not save any data that you've put into that screen. So highly recommend using save, save and next, and only using the arrows if you're truly just paging through and you haven't added any content. Next slide, please, Nikki. In the essence of time for today, I'm gonna skip several sections of the person-centered plan and skip down to the my life planning section. This section of the person-centered plan um, is where the content that you add under the getting the life I want is pre-populated. So I wanted to be able to show you that. And one of the areas is the goals. So where I added what I want to stay the same, maintain, and what I want to um, be different, add, change, stop, each of those multi-add items will create a separate goal in the My Goals section of the plan. And when it's created, it will just give you the goal name, which will have come from that item. And then you as the case manager or care coordinator would need to populate the remaining fields of the goal. The subsections of the My Life Planning section in addition to My Goals are My Life Planning Person-Centered Thinking Tools, the My Goal section, which we, I was just mentioning, My Goal Review, My Needs, My Strengths, My Barriers, Services and Supports, Change and Waiver Services, State Review, and Medication Review Dates. In order to populate the rest of the fields under My Goals, it is recommended that you skip over My Goals and go directly down to Services and Supports and start populating from services and supports and work your way back up to my goals. So you just wanna confirm your goal titles, go down to services and supports and start populating those, then go to barriers, then my strengths, then my needs, and then go back to goals to fill out the rest of these questions. And the reason for that is that you wanna make sure that your um, selections, there are some selection lists are um, populated for you before you finish rounding up the goals. Next slide, please, Nikki. Upon clicking on services and supports in the quick scroll menu, you will be navigated to that page where you'll find a green multi-add list button and it'll have the label of plus add service or support. And I circled that on the left-hand side of the screenshot. It's sort of grayed out in the background because I'd already clicked that when I took this screenshot. And then once you do that, the system will prevent present you with a pop-up modal as seen here in the center of the screen. And the first field in that modal is to pick a list, pick, is a pick list of services and supports types. That includes case management, community natural resources, non-waiver services, waiver services, and proposed waiver services. Proposed waiver services should only be used when you're applying for a new waiver. Next slide, please, Nikki. In this example, I selected waiver service, and then I clicked on the search icon to find the service I wanted to link to this PCP. You can see there's a quick keyword search or an advanced search option, which I've circled up at the top here. Since I knew the procedure code of the service I was looking for, I typed T2021 into the quick search. You, However, you can use uh, service titles or descriptions, and it will search on those keywords as well. The system will return you a list of services that match your criteria that you've entered and match the program of this PCP. So in this case, I was doing section 29. So the results that are being returned to me include um, T2021 and they are main care section 29 services. 
each service will be delineated by a line above and below. So in this screenshot, you can see three. I've circled the first one, which is community membership dash community only group 29. And the reason that there are multiple services, even though I said T2021 is because these have different modifiers. So this one is T2021UB. You'll use the plus link button to actually select that service to add to your PCP. So I've circled that plus link button in the middle one here. Um, in this example, um, I ended up choosing um, the third one that you can't see. Next slide here, uh, please, Nikki. So I chose community membership dash community only individuals 29, which is um, T2021 UA. And you can see part of that title, it's cut off by the container there under the service name. So this is my waiver service. And I had clicked that little search button and it gave me those results and I selected one and now it has populated it in the service field for me. Please note that I um, intentionally skipped the provider field here and we'll come back to my reasoning for that. The system displayed for me the rate unit amount and the rate unit type for the service that I selected, which is a 15 minute unit. The system also defaulted my effective date range to my plan start and end date. These are editable fields, so you can edit that if needed. Then I was able to select the frequency for this service. This service only had one frequency for me to choose from and it was six months. And that is because this service will create two six month prior authorizations in the MIM system. And then it allowed me to indicate how many hours per week I wanted for this service, so I've put 10. This um, modal also includes the description of scope, the um, whether any portion of the service is being offered in a non-disability setting, and it also has a text field to describe when the person will no longer need or want these supports. Next slide, please, Nikki. Upon saving the service, you'll see what is displayed here um, in the screenshot. Please note again that that provider field has been intentionally left blank. This is because the plan requires a state review before completing the provider selection. So you'll fill out the remainder of the services, you'll continue on and do your barrier strengths, needs, goals, and then you'll finish um, whatever the planning team meeting needs to finish before you go into the next status. Next slide, please, Nikki. After entering all the services and supports, it's recommended that you review and edit the My Barriers and My Strengths sections. In this screenshot, you can see that the strengths of motivated and good with finances have migrated in from the comprehensive assessment. The case manager will also, and or care coordinator, will also have the ability to add more strengths and or barriers directly here within the PCP if that's needed. You'll do that by scrolling to the bottom of the page that you're on and using the plus add buttons. So in this case, I'm on the my strengths page. If I needed to add additional strengths that had not been captured in my comprehensive assessment, I would scroll to the bottom of this page and I would find a little plus add strengths button which I would use to add additional strengths. But you can see here, these two came from the source of comprehensive assessment. They migrated right in and were already populated for me. Next slide, please, Nikki. After reviewing the strengths and barriers, we recommend doing the same for the my needs. Any needs captured in the comprehensive assessment will migrate in with a status of unmet. The case manager should edit each need and populate the remaining fields that are uh, specific to that need, including an indication of whether this is a resource need, yes or no, and updating the status to reflect whether the services or supports added below will meet this need or not. So if you've added services and supports that will meet this need, you can update the status to met as I've done in the screenshot. And you can also see that the source of this was comprehensive assessment. Next slide, please, Nikki. 
Once all of those sections have been reviewed and completed, then you can circle back and complete the remaining goal fields. In this example, I've selected the goal of visiting the gym Monday, Wednesday, Friday, so that I could finish populating it. I entered the desired outcome and can see that the system had, uh, has already auto-populated the domain of health and wellness for me. And that's because that is where this goal was captured, was under the health and wellness domain. However, as the case manager or care coordinator, you do have the ability to modify that if needed right here. Next slide, please, Nikki. The case manager then has the ability to select the corresponding strengths, barriers, risks, needs, and services and supports associated with each goal. Please note that if you attempt to populate the goal fields before you've completed those other subsections, then your dual lists may not include all of the selections that you require. Next slide, please, Nikki. Once the planning team has completed all the sections that are required for the state review, the case manager will set the plan to the status of pending state review. This action will trigger a notification to the resource coordinators, letting them know that there is a person-centered plan for that person, in this case, Leslie Test, which is requiring their state review. Then the resource coordinator who's logged in, in this example, Sandra, resource coordinator, I've circled her in the upper right-hand corner so you could see I was logged in as a resource coordinator would use the notifications icon, navigate to their notifications. And you can see I've circled the first row here. This was my person-centered plan that created that notification for them. And it says state review is required. And then all that resource coordinator needs to do is click on that row and it will navigate them directly into that PCP to do their review and then set the status to the next um, workflow status. Next slide, please, Nikki. After reviewing the plan contents, the resource coordinator will populate the state review fields that you can see in the background of the screenshot. So there's a couple of questions, a yes and no, and then a comments field. And then they'll use the status dropdown, which I've opened up here in this screenshot, and they'll select submit for provider selection. This will change the workflow status from pending state review to pending provider selection. Next slide, please, Nikki. That will also, that change in status will also trigger another notification to the assigned case manager or care coordinator. In this example, Jesse CCM, I've circled them in the upper right hand corner. That's my case manager, community case manager, letting them know that the state review has been completed and the plan is ready for provider selection. So Jesse would click on notifications. He would see that um, first row there that I've circled that says that provider selection is now required. And then Jesse would do the same thing, just click on that row and it'll navigate them right back into that person-centered plan so they can complete that part of the process. Next slide, please, Nikki. Please note that the current vendor call process should still be used to identify providers if the person does not know which providers they would like to invite to submit service implementation plans. Once the providers are known, the case manager or care coordinator should invite the providers to submit service implementation plans using the multi-add button under each waiver service under this header of service implementation plan provider invitations. It's at the bottom of each waiver service. So you'd open it up, scroll down, you'd see this plus add provider and you can add one or more providers for that specific service. And then the system will take it from there. Next slide, please, Nikki. Upon clicking that um, button and adding the provider, um, the uh, service implementation plan, or, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, upon clicking the plus add button, you'll be presented with a provider search field. And I circled that at the bottom of the screenshot, it's sort of in the background and grayed out. And you'll click search and then it'll pop up this modal that you're seeing front and center here. From here, you can search for the provider that you want to invite. It will give you a list of providers that are appropriate to provide this service. So in this case, section 29 providers that have been authorized to provide this particular service. Um, and you can use the quick search using keywords or you can use the advanced search to narrow the results more. Next slide, please, Nikki. 
Upon selecting the provider and saving, the system will then trigger a notification to that selected provider, letting them know that they've been invited to submit a service implementation plan. That provider does not necessarily have an assignment to the person record yet, so they will need to fill out that service implementation plan in their location profile, in their staff user pro profile under their location forms and plans. They'll be able to see the SIP from there and fill it out. The system will also add the SIP to the SIP tab of the PCP. So you can see that I've uh, circled the SIP tab because that's what I was on when I took this screenshot. And you can see that this service implementation plan has been added here. Um, if I had invited that provider to um, provide a SIP for an additional service or I invited other providers to provide um, a SIP for this service, there'd be multiple rows in here. But I, in this example, I had just done the one. In this example, I invited CCM Works to submit a service implementation plan for community membership, community only individual 29 service. And I did that on November 8th. And the SIP is in a status of in progress because the provider had not yet completed it for my review with the person. Next slide, please, Nikki. As the case manager, I can click open the SIP from that SIP tab. And as you can see from the screenshot, the SIP has a similar structure and navigation to the PCP, and the user can click the toggle icon in the upper right-hand corner to see all sections of the SIP, which are SIP template, goals, goal and service details, which those both of those sections are displayed from within the PCP. There's nothing for the provider to fill out there. Um, it's the sections of the PCP that they will need to see in order to provide the plan. And then the service implementation SIP details section, which is the portion that will be populated by the provider. Once the provider has populated the SIP with those details, they will set the status on the SIP to submit um, for, and that will submit the SIP for review. This will then trigger another automated notification to the assigned case manager or care coordinator who will use that to navigate in and review and approve the submitted SIPs with the person. Please note that I'm not gonna go uh, into any more detail related to the service implementation plan form at this time. However, um, providers will have the opportunity to participate in service implementation training in December. Next slide, please, Nikki. Upon approval of the service implementation plan or plans, the case manager or care coordinator will navigate back to the My Life Planning section, navigate to the specific waiver service in the person-centered plan, and populate that vacant or empty provider field with the selected provider and then save. After all the waiver services have been updated to reflect the selected providers, the case manager will complete the remaining sections of the plan um, some of those being the SIP survey and then capturing signatures. And then the case manager or care coordinator will use the status dropdown to set the plan to complete. This action will trigger the system to auto create the prior authorizations, as well as a notification to the resource coordinators that the prior authorizations are ready for review and their authorization. And it will also auto assign those providers to the person record. So they will now have access to the person record. Next slide, please, Nikki. In Evergreen, the prior authorizations are considered a form and can be found by, and can be located by navigating to the all forms list page under the forms plans icon, just like we did for the PCP conference assessment, reportable event, et cetera. In this screenshot, you can see that a, oh, sorry, I think I got ahead of us, Nikki. Um, already, already, there we go. Uh, nope, can you go forward a little bit? Sorry, <laughs> one more. There we go. In this screenshot, you can see that um, there's a prior authorization record at the top here. Um, and that is my, um, prior authorization that was just created when I set my PCP to complete. But you can see that the um, details are pretty generic. It just has the form ID, that it's a prior authorization, it's for main care section 29, um, and it was created on November 7th. 
um, and a few other details there. Next slide, please, Nikki. By using the little filter icon in the upper right hand corner, which is that upside down pyramid hamburger looking icon, you can go to the pr prior authorization custom list page. This list page, which you're seeing in the center of the screen here, has more details specific to the prior authorization form itself. So um, in addition to the ones that we saw on the previous screen, we also see the um, PA number, the provider name, the NPI plus three for that provider location, the service name, the procedure code and its modifiers, and the start and end date for that PA. You can open the prior authorization from either list by clicking on the row. Um, it's just that this one will give you more details. Next slide, please, Nikki. Upon system creation, the prior authorization will be in a status of in progress with a source of person-centered plan if it was auto-created off the person-centered plan. Please note that resource coordinators and care monitors do have the ability to create PAs directly from within the PA form itself. Um, and they can do that from the all forms list page or the custom PA list page using that plus add forms button and their role will allow them to create a PA without it being automatically created off the PCP. However, generally PAs should be created off the PCPs and that should only be used in emergent situations. The sections of the PA form include overview, provider information, original request, and service information. The first three sections will be auto-populated if the PA was created off the PCP as it should be. The service information section is the section that will be populated by the resource coordinator or the care monitor. Next slide, please, Nikki. Upon selecting a service line from the service information section, the resource coordinator will be navigated to the service details page, which you're seeing here. It will be in a status of pending review. The requested service details will be displayed from the PCP on the left-hand side, which I've circled. The resource coordinator or care monitor would use the right arrow or that little carrot icon in the center of the screen that I circled to copy those details into the authorized service fields, which are on the right-hand side. Once they copy those, the resource coordinator has the ability to make any necessary edits before completing the decision section, decision information section below. Please note that I'm not going to go any further into the PA form either during this webinar. However, resource coordinators and care monitors will also have the opportunity to participate in prior authorization training in December as well. Next slide, please, Nikki. So what's next? Uh, please continue to read our email communications, which will be sent out after each webinar series. Please also, um, uh, we also intend to send out some additional communications in um, December and January, one reminding you about training and one reminding you about the upcoming deploy. Please continue to work on cleaning up your EIS data to ensure the most successful migration possible. Um, you can find the details on how you can do that in the email that was sent out on September 25th had a subject of update on Evergreen Release 3 rollout and has also been posted to our project website. And also make sure that you register for your role-based technical training sessions. The technical training sessions are being posted now. Uh, some of them are out there, I think, on the project website already. The remainder will be posted if they're not already out there today over the course of the next day or so. Um, we may also be adding some role-based training um, in a week or so, but we will notify you once all the registration links are out there, hopefully later this week. Um, next slide, please, Nikki. So how can you stay engaged and get additional support resources? Please continue to leverage the volunteer network of change champions. You can find a list of those change champions on our project web website and a little bit more information about them. They are helping us with the transition at the grassroots level. Um, some of your peers that can help answer some of your questions for you. Also, as a reminder, all of the project communications are sent by email. So please make sure that your email address is correct in the EIS system. If it's not, please use our EIS support.dhhs at main.gov email address to get that updated. If you have any questions or feedback or you want to reach out for any reason, you can reach out to the project team at evergreen.dhhs at main.gov. Nancy Kitchen is um, monitoring that box for us now, so she's helping us respond to those a little bit more timely. 
And you can also go to our project website at maine.gov slash DHHS slash EIS slash Evergreen, and you can find all of our communications, all of the other recorded webinar sessions from series one and series two. So if you didn't get a chance or you want to listen back, you can listen to those again. Um, and you can also see the remaining registration links for the other two sessions for this webinar series. So if any of your colleagues haven't um, participated, you can encourage them to do so. And you can see the technical training sessions that have been posted so far. And again, the remainder will be out there um, before, the, before the week is over. Next slide, please, Nikki. So we've reached the Q&A portion. I do have a couple of questions already in the Q&A. If you have questions, please go ahead and start typing those into the Q&A now. We do have about 14 minutes left and I will respond to as many questions as I can today. Karen asks, is there a time frame for ICF's Section 50 to begin using Evergreen? Uh, so um, hopefully I'll answer your question correctly correctly, Karen. So some ICF's IIDs currently use EIS uh, to submit reportable events for persons that they that are um, residing in their facilities. Those users will continu continue to use EIS until the deploy, and they will start using Evergreen at the same time that everyone else does to report those reportable events. Cynthia asks, I may have missed this, but will the BMS 99 information currently in EIS populate to the comprehensive assessment in this transition? Great question, Cynthia. You did not miss it. I did not share that information, and I'm glad you asked that question. So as I mentioned, the comprehensive assessment will be replacing the BMS 99, psychosocial, and portions of the V7, and the remainder of the V7 will be replaced in the PCP in Evergreen. Because those three existing forms don't translate very nicely to the comprehensive assessment, we are not migrating them directly into the comprehensive assessment form in Evergreen. However, we do want you to have access to them from within Evergreen. So we are migrating the BMS 99s, psychosocials, and the V7s as attachments, uploaded attachments to the person record so that you can see them in Evergreen and use that content to populate your first comprehensive assessment. So you won't need to fill out a comprehensive assessment immediately upon going live in Evergreen. The first time that you will need to fill out a comprehensive assessment for each person that you serve is at time of their annual planning. So comprehensive assessments do need to be filled out if a person comes to us brand new. So it's a brand new person that we're serving, an initial comprehensive assessment should be completed or if it's a person that we've been serving, it should be done before their annual plan. So at a minimum, you would need to do that first one in Evergreen before their annual plan. However, if there is a significant change for that person before it come becomes time to do their annual plan, you should also fill out a comprehensive assessment in Evergreen for significant changes. And what I mean by significant change is a change in need, a change in waiver service, or a significant change like a move of residence, then you might want to um, fill out a comprehensive assessment before completing that revision to the PCP so that that additional need strength barrier data is captured in the comprehensive assessment and flows forward into that PCP. Uh, someone else asks, when it comes to the automation of goals, will there be a way to change a goal so individuals can choose their goals? Um, so goals are going to be created, auto-populated in that section of the plan based on what the person has indicated as um, domain-based items that they want to stay the same or they want to change add stop. So the goals have been indicated by the person when discussing each domain and what they like and they want to keep the same and what they want to change add or stop. However, goals can be changed at any time. So if a person decides that they want to change their goal, then their case manager or care coordinator can come in and do a revision to the PCP and modify that goal. Um, so you can change the status of that goal. If they just want to discontinue one that was there, you can discontinue it. If they want to add a whole new one, you can add a whole new one. If they want to um, just modify the one that was in there slightly, you can do that as well. And um, you also can 
um, update goal status by revising the PCP at the 90 day review. And there's a whole section um, about the goal status and updating the status to, sh to show progress. Karen asks um, again about section 50. Oh, for the PCP process. Thank you, Karen. Um, so apologies that I uh, didn't catch that at the beginning. Uh, no, I'm not aware of a time frame for ICFs or IIDs to start using Evergreen for the person-centered planning process at this time yet, but we'll certainly jot that down and we'll discuss that with business and um, we'll add that to our frequently asked questions. Um, and I'm sure it's uh, on the future roadmap for the project. Aaron asks, what if we are in the middle of a PCP at the time of transition to Evergreen? Fabulous question, Aaron. So um, if there's a PCP that's in progress in EIS at the time that we're doing our migration, so the uh, transition to Evergreen will start on Friday, January 12th at 5 p.m., and it will be a three-day process that will occur from that evening through the holiday weekend. And then all of our users will start using the system on Tuesday morning, January 16th. If your PCP is in progress, when we lock down EIS at five o'clock on Friday the 12th, it will migrate in its in-progress state. So the PCP form will migrate over into Evergreen and it will migrate whatever data was captured in EIS into the appropriate Evergreen related fields. And then you'll be able to finish the PCP in Evergreen on 16 or after. It looks like those are all the questions that I had in the chat. We do still have a few minutes left. So if anybody has any questions, please feel free to type them into the Q&A. I'll also point out that Nikki was gracious enough to add our project website link as well as our EIS support email and our um, Evergreen project email addresses right into the chat. So if you want to grab those, you can certainly do that at the, at this time. Um, also, if you think of any questions after this um, webinar is closed, you can certainly email those to us at evergreen.dhhs at main.gov, and we'll add those to our frequently asked questions list, and we'll provide those responses out on our project website. And I will also mention that we are still working on getting the frequently asked questions from our first two webinar series out there. We did get a, a good number of frequently asked questions. And so it's taking us a little bit of time to um, merge them all together because we get similar questions on the different sessions. Um, so we're trying to get those all merged down and together so that we can get them posted out there for you and expect to have some of those posted out there this week. I don't see any additional questions um, in the Q&A. So I think that means we can adjourn for today. I want to again, thank all of you for joining us at 4 p.m. at the end of your day. Hopefully this was helpful and we look forward to seeing you in training and please um, recommend to your colleagues that have not participated in this series to get signed up for one of our sessions tomorrow. We have one at 8 a.m. and one at noon. And if not, we'll uh, keep your eye out for our email communication when all the training registration links have been posted.